Oh man, how do I get this intro going on? Welcome <laughs> back to Everyday Struggle. Uh, today's Hump Day Wednesday, and unfortunately, man, it's, it's just the two of us, Wayno. Right it's just the two of us. Uh, uh, for everyone who didn't know, uh, we're on the East Coast. We're all doing this stuff at home, but uh, unfortunately, the Deska she didn't miss the show episode like me. <laughs> she basically have no, she has no power, and we do this electronically via the internet. So. Uh, me and Wayne, we're going to hold it down. We're going to thug it out for today. Let's do it. Which means I could get directly at him. He could get directly at me. And um, Nadeska, fix your power issues or get a generator. Please, <laughs> you're too rich for that. She's too hey, rich man, for she that. has hey. a generator, but she has to conserve her energy. Let's not do that. You're, you're right. <laughs> you're right. You're right. But I will say, listen, um, we have a bunch of topics that, you know, it's not. It's a kind of a slow Wednesday. But a topic that we didn't get to yesterday, which was Waka Flocka um, saying that Big Crit is the most underrated rapper of his generation, he called Big Crit um, the Southern version of Nas, mm. and I wanted to hear your opinion on this, Wayno. Yeah, so so look, I, right, like I do agree that Big Crit is definitely underrated. While Big Crit is underrated, I don't think that he, Nas is underrated at all. Like you, I, I don't think Nas is underrated. Now people look at Nas and just say. Well, he's not so much in the forefront of everybody knowing his business. So they think that he's a little bit more reserved. But think about this. I love Big Crit. Crit was here, was great. That's one of my favorite projects. Um, Cadillac. I, I always mess up the name, but it's Cadillac Galactica or something like that. I love that project as well, especially the Deluxe. Can't say it either. Right. Um, even Crit is here from last year, one of my favorite projects. But I don't feel like any of those equates to an Illmatic or a It Was Written or an I Am. When people say that Nas is underrated, we got to think, yo, like, this motherfucker got some of the most critically acclaimed projects ever to grace hip-hop. His music is taught in schools and all of that. I don't think that you are un- you can be underrated and have those accolades. Now, Big Crit, I- I, I, go ahead, my boy. Well, I, I was trying to also add some clarity, because mm-hmm. I know we really jumped into the topic, to add some clarity and some substance to, you know, the comment that um Waka made. He said, and by the way, this was on Drink Champs, so salute to them. He said, listen, if I had to pick one artist to go against any artist, mm-hmm. and there's just not one nigga in hip-hop today that I think about, young or old, that could pretty much out-rap Big Crit with substance. So these are the criteria. This is okay, how okay, he okay, makes okay. criteria. With substance, title, understanding, and a complete body of an album. Crit is the illest. Oh, I definitely agree there. I, I, that's what I'm saying. I can't take that away from him. I definitely agree there as far as like if you stack him up against other people. Now, I just think that Crit, hmm, I wouldn't even say that he doesn't play the game or nothing like that because Crit has been on like different award shows. He's he's gotten <clears throat> great interviews and shit like that. I think that like his music is kind of a quiet taste a bit for a certain type of crowd. But I think that he could compete with anybody. Rapping wise, I don't think there's many people that can rap him at all. Or even be on his level, especially today. I feel like he's in an elite. If there was an elite 10 of rappers that rap today, he's definitely in there. Hmm. Now, and, and, and let me keep adding. By the way, I'm yeah. moderating slash debates. Yeah, so, so please, guys, give me a chance. <laughs> anyway, now, you know, he did continue by saying like he's one of the most powerful young niggas. And he said that Crit is a Southern version of Nas. Now, I'm going to I'm, I'm tell you where... That statement brought me to. Okay. It brought me back to where T.I. was kind of mentioning how Southern artists, sometimes we kind of frown. And by the way, even that the fact that this is a debate, mm-hmm. even though you're, you're not saying anything contrary, Southern artists, like, we don't give them their due respect. Mm. And truthfully, I do think the reason why he's underrated is, is a lot where he's from. Yeah. I think it's not out of talent. I mean, of course, you could probably say some visibility. I get that. But I do believe it's where he's from. And because he is from the South, that honestly, when we talk about lyricists, when we discuss people, um, at least even the new generation or the current rappers who are, you know, in, 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 the, in the mix of, you know, the top lyricists or, you know, people making some good shit, he gets left out of the conversation. And sadly... I think where he's from actually definitely uh, contributes to that. I think it, it, definitely I, I agree with you there where, where he's from, but I also think that it's a part of like mainstream media, like how mainstream media perceives lyricism because it's like, for me, the South is super respected when it comes to lyricism. All the way back to Scarface, to T.I., to Andre, to 
fucking ludicrous. It's like the kids of today that know ludicrous know him from Fast and Furious. I know him for being one of the best rappers out the South. Like majority of the rappers that came in the nineties and the early two thousands, of course you got your mixtures of a lot of artists that just had like super energy, hard records or whatever, but it's a lot of lyricists from the South. Now I think that yeah, I think T.I. was like the first one to get the the lyricism like respect. There is definitely a, a a difference between how we perceive, but I think that's only in mainstream media. If you're talking to anybody, like anybody that knows lyricism, that does media, when we bring up rappers who rap, you got to bring up people from the South. It's impossible not to. Like, it's impossible. Yeah, and, and what we also forget about, you know, he's he's part of that, like, kind of almost legendary freshman class. The, 20, the 2011 freshman class, he was with, I believe, Meek, Lil B, YG, mm-hmm. Lil Twist, uh, Yellow Wolf, Fred the Godson, um, so, uh, Mac Miller, uh, Kendrick Lamar, and Diggy Simmons, right? right. Um, we did have a fan question, though, which which this kind of ties into, and salute to my man, Key underscore Midwest, for sending this in. Because as we're talking about someone being the Southern version of Nas, I guess just let's talk about just this whole new generation or maybe a post generation after the Nas and Jay-Z era. Yeah. Um, he Midwest says, is J. Cole this generation's Nas? And if so, is Drake this generation's Hope? Like, is is that the easy way to look at this? I think, I think you know what, that's equated to... I, I, when, when I hear these things, I, I'm used to equate it to, do they say, are they saying that they're just as good or better rappers than? Now I equate it to like just their space in the overall game because I feel like as an artist, J. Cole may have exceeded a lot of things that Nas has done. And even J, I mean, even Drake, like Drake has exceeded a lot of different things that Jay had done at his certain age in his career. I think <clears throat> we just got to equate that to being like the top guy and they respect the right. It's like J. Cole. While he does have hit records, like Nas got hit records, you don't think about his shit ringing off in the party. You know what I mean? Like, you don't think about Nas shit ringing off in the party or J. Cole's, but it can. Same shit with, with, with um, Drake. You think more of the dude who has lyricism, but can also m- make the drinks that could fucking rock stadiums. So I think it's compared in that space. I used to get more personal with it. Like, he'll never be or they'll never be. You know what I'm saying? But I think that if you put it in that type of context of how I explained it, I think that you could you could possibly say that. But I also, I'm real personal when it comes to Nas and Jay-Z to feel like there will never be another one of them. And I feel like even with Cole and Drake, I feel like they're one-on-ones. Like, but it would just be who holds a certain type of space in the game at that time. Yeah, the interesting, even like, in, uh, interesting point in that, and, and you know, salute to uh, Key Midwest for sending that in, mm-hmm. because I, I do feel like, forget the question, because... I'm down with that comparison. Of course, they're not direct replicas, right? right in right. terms of Jay being um, Drake being this generation's Jay, but like it, it, it does fill a role. Right. So I then go, I, I then go further to think or say, or even come up with a theory to say, wait, in every generation, are we always going to kind of get the guy who's a little bit more commercial but still super respected on his lyricism and on the pen? You know, that that's the Drake, that's the Jay, right? Mm-hmm. But he's but he, he's very mainstream as well. And then we're always going to have, you know, his counterpart or the person across the aisle that also is at top of the culture is a guy who's a little bit more, you know, a little less commercialized, but, like, he's he's more about, like, content and, you know, um, lyricism and center. Yeah. I'm wondering if we ever get a, a generation where we get two J's. Like, mm-hmm. and what I'm saying, I'm just talking about the archetype. I get what you mean. Like, mean. a two J's. So, and, and um yeah, so I have no, I have no problem with that. that. I have no problem with that. What makes me think, that... See, now, look, again, well, I mean, when we say this generation, we talking mm-hmm. about the past, like, 10 years of Drake and Cole giving us everything they've given us. I'm wondering now, like, and back relating it back to the South, I'm wondering now, like, how, where little baby is going to be put. You know what I mean? Like, going forward for this, for, for the generation, for the kids of right now, like, his his run, I feel like baby is definitely going to go on a 10-year run, if not more. What, what, what space will he fill? Are, are people going to consider him the next Wayne? Because I feel like, you know, if you have a J, when we think of J and we think of Nas, we think of like the holy grail or the fucking pinnacle of the height of lyricism and artistry, right? When I think of Lil mm-hmm. Wayne, I think of Lil Wayne in that space too. You know what I mean, I yeah. think of Lil Wayne in that space too. So I think like, you know, are we going to start including Wayne's name into that? Because the whole Jay-Z, big, I mean, the Jay-Z, Nas shit, it always relates back to Jay-Z's quote, Biggie, Jay-Z, and Nas, and them being the top three. What is the next top threes? Like you know how it was 
Drake Kendrick Cole. Or yeah. Drake, or Drake Cole Kendrick, whatever, like. Yo, that's a great point. And, you know, see, since I'm kind of moderating too, right. I gotta wrap myself up. <laughs> right. uh, well, I, this one point, and I hope to discuss it in future episodes. I heard a brilliant comparison. They said where Little Baby's at right now mm-hmm. is probably where um, where Little Baby's at right now, where Drake is at, is probably where Lil Wayne was at right before he went on that run, and he started proclaiming, saying he's the best rapper the best alive. Rapper. Where mm-hmm. everybody was looking at, yo, is this guy tripping? Like, this is the guy. But, of course, we saw what happened then and people, like, you know, really buying into that wave. And, you know, Jay, Jay went on to other things. And, you know, of course, he was still passively doing stuff. But it, it's interesting seeing how, you know, maybe history repeats itself with even some of these archetypes and roles. Anyway, yeah. um, this is the toughest part of, uh, of moderating. I got to wrap myself up. But, <laughs> wrap it up. and Elite Chopper. Okay. And Elite Chopper, he actually uh, called out some rappers for not using their platforms to help their followers. And um, he sent out a tweet, and he says, yo, if these rap niggas spoke up about what's really going on right now and use their platform to help people that's following them understand where the world is headed right now, everyone would be more on the same page. But these niggas scared to speak up. I'm gonna speak up, though. Now, NLE Chopper, by the way, he's, shoot, he said a lot of, he's been very active on social media trying to use his platform. Um, What do you think about this, Wayno? I'm a little, uh, so... You know, this kind of confused me a bit only because, like, I've met NLE Chopper a few times. I met his mom. I met his, like, his whole family. Like, he, mm-hmm. to me, is, like, a really, really good kid, right? Yeah. But with that being said and him making a bold statement like this, I'm like, well, what does NLE Chopper really use his platform for? Because I know if I Google him, I look him up, I could see him punching through walls, fighting, threatening people, all types of shit. What is his platform really used for? And I think that, like, is you put yourself in a very funny space when you know you're out here criticizing people for shit that you're not really doing, you know? Um, yeah, of course, everybody could should should be bringing awareness to to different things that that need to be fixed in this country and this world. But when an elite chop is saying it, I don't want to hear that nigga talk about shit like that. You know what I mean? Like, like I feel like he's late to the party. Yeah, like, like I've like, seen a lot of people try to use their platforms, and I'm like. Hey, we'll give you credit and acknowledge you for using your platform a little bit better than we've seen you use it in the past. But it's one of those things where, like, you know, the person who's never donated a dime, the first day he donates ten dollars, he look around like, you niggas don't give no money here. <laughs> right. Nobody donates but me. You get me? Right. So, it, so it kind of came across as that. I'm gonna be honest with you. By and large, I'm I'm super proud of most, if not kind of all rappers, and how they have used their platforms to you know, amplify certain things. Even some of the rappers who you may say, you know, um, because of the type of content they produce, maybe they want to shy away from that because they might not be the well, the most well-informed, the well-versed in some of these issues. No, we saw pretty much a united stand on, you know, people trying to bring some light to, whether it's, you know, um, on the death of Breonna Taylor and right. what's going on with that situation. The other situations that, you know, it's been really very... Uh, 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 very tense situations in the country. So I think NLE Chop is tweaking. I think he feel like he been woke recently and yeah. he thought everybody been sleeping. No, everybody, you're probably the last of the party, bro. Yeah, and I, I, like, it's just, he goes on these rants and sometimes like these rants don't really lead to anything. It's like, he'll be on all of that and then tomorrow it'll be some other shit. You know what I'm saying? So it's he'll like- be with somebody tomorrow. Exactly. He's kind of like a, a fucking Rubik's Cube that you got to put together in the dark. I really don't know what he is, like, especially after meeting him. And I'm not saying that to take anything from him. I think that he's talented. I think that he has a little wave, but at the same time, you got to give yourself a little bit. You, you got to give yourself a little bit more time in the game before you start going out and saying shit like that. Because when we think of you saying stuff in this in this matter, I can't think of anything he's ever done to use his platform platform for for positivity. You know, and I'm not saying that to shun him. I'm just saying like it, it, when I think of him, that doesn't ring off. And, and by the way, you know he's a younger guy and very new into right. the rap game, as you just mentioned. And you know. He, before he even sent this tweet tweet out, he probably should have looked up, sorry, um, No Name. Mm-hmm. And when No Name was saying, hey, some of y'all niggas was rapping about that Black Lives Matter shit, what's up, where y'all at? Mm-hmm. There's a lot of ways we could see how Jay-Z has moved during this time. There's right. a lot of ways how you could be very active. Right. You could be using your platform. Doesn't mean by sending out tweets. Right. Not everybody, that's their way, but helping and you know using other platforms. So people are doing stuff in the in background, you know? Absolutely. So, um, we'll see. Anyway, um, 
I try to run through my uh, my quick numbers segment because we got to talk about Logic. Okay. Uh, first of all, Logic did debut at number two on the Billboard charts. Uh, his album No Pressure did 221,000 copies, astronomical numbers. Uh, Juice World still hanging in there with over 100,000 in sales. He did a 107 in his third week. Pop Smoke also did 107. Um, Gunna, he was at like 67,000. He had a deluxe of his album out. Little Baby still hanging in there. He's not going nowhere. Mm -hmm. And Kid, the Kid Leroy actually um, debuted with 40K. Now, Logic. Logic. Because Logic did say this is his last album now. And Logic talked about someone who we, we both have some mutual ties to. Yeah. And while talking about not only fans bullying him, he said about particularly even a journalist, well, rapper turned journalist now, I think I could say that, yeah. right, or media personality. He said about Joe, he said, and this, he said in an interview with Peter Rosenberg, he said, I literally have no issue with Joe. Never met him. He doesn't like me for whatever reason. He wants to say I'm not black enough. I'm not good enough. He's a person who led to part of my depression and some of my darkest spaces. He also added that, he says, bro, your words, they literally make people want to kill themselves, and that's a real thing. Mm. Do you think, and and I know you watch some of Joe content. We Absolutely. all do, right? Absolutely. Do you think Joe's um, comments or criticism, or maybe even other me media members within the space, have been too harsh at Logic? Um, I don't want to say that Logic should have gotten used to this, right? I don't, I don't want to say that. Because um, you know, word the the power of the tongue is 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 a motherfucker, right? Now, I just I, I view it as this: people got to remember that Joe, while he has changed his career and going into a media space, and his foundation is rap. He's a rapper, and he was always outspoken as a rapper, saying that niggas couldn't fuck with him or he didn't like certain rappers. That's what got, kind of got him into a lot of the the problems that he had as an artist by telling people that they couldn't fuck with him. So it's like. For me, I always expect that from Joe. Now, yeah. when it comes to Logic, first of all, I knew Logic was going to be all right. He always does 200-something thousand every time he comes out. And if Taylor Swift doesn't sell a whole fucking mall's worth of merchandise, she don't get the number one album. You know what I mean? She might not have the number one album. Now, I think that words could be harsh, but when, when I heard Logic say this, I'm like, yo, brother, you made yourself the poster child for, you know, standing strong and being able to have transparency and talk through these types of things when he made the 1-800, I can't remember the name of the, the record. Mm -hmm. you know, and it was a great, I think it was a great record that brought a lot of awareness. But I looked at it like, damn, dog, like, it ain't, to me, I didn't feel it was that deep. I don't feel like Joe makes you want to kill yourself. Now, he might say some shit that'll fuck you up and you'd be like, damn, for real? But I don't think that, you know, him as an artist, for all the things he's gotten through that he would feel that way. Well, Joe also did that. Uh, he said, and he said this on live. I'm not apologizing. Exactly what he said is exactly what I said. What I said. He's a pander king. Mm. So I'm going to throw it back to you one more time before okay. I jump in. Do you think that this is slightly, hey, let me play the victim a bit or maybe pandering in terms of how he's using the criticism to kind of explain his possible or upcoming hiatus from the rap game? I think I think that is definitely on brand, as people would say. Like I, I think that is on brand. I think that uh, I like that term. On brand. <laughs> I, think, I think it's definitely on brand. But I, I think that like for um for logic, like yeah, he does like it. Just got annoying after a bit. Now, like the first album, we got it. We understood like who you were, where you came from. But yeah, he does do a little bit of pandering. I felt like he did the same shit like Chance the Rapper, like. He raps and then it, and puts disclaimers in after every of, of a couple bars. Like, yeah, I'm in a strip okay. club, but, you know, while I throw this money, I'm going to make sure I respect these women. Like, my nigga, I don't want to hear that. Like, <laughs> hey, just throw the money. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And I feel like it was too much of that when we talk about rap. It's like, yo, dog, the rap is art. You, you, you don't have to explain that shit. Put it out there and let it be judged. And I think that he just was walking a very... A uh, very fine line, not not fine line, but what's that shit in the circuits, man? That fucking, you know, that line act that they walk on. Yeah, I know, I know, I know. Yeah, I, know, like, I, know. I, I feel like he was just walking a line to be safe as an artist, but he didn't really have to be that tightrope. Yeah, I, I feel like he, all he had to really do was just rap. Like, I don't question his rapping ability, but the context of his raps make it seem like, uh, okay, it does get a little bit boring as a fan. 
you see with an artist like Logic, and this is where you have to really approach it with sensitivity, because when it when an artist or anyone says, "Hey, some of your words or your criticisms," and and by the way, this is something that that moves from criticism to abuse. When they're mm-hmm. saying that these things are making me feel certain type of ways, lead into my depression. Some of your words could lead to somebody losing their life or committing suicide. Right. You get me? These are very ser- serious things. Right. Now. I guess, like, you know, and I, and, I, and I watched the multiple conversations he had. I want to know, where does he think criticism come into play in hip-hop? Hmm. Now, I, I personally believe that he just doesn't think some of the criticism is fair, which that's fine, and he could definitely respond to it. But I do believe that it's kind of feeling like he don't want to be criticized at all. <laughs> and. And where does where does he fit in with that act? Because criticism comes at the conception of the rhyme. Like as soon as you say something, somebody's gonna have something. Especially in this internet era where everybody has access and everybody can break shit down. So yeah, well, well, yeah, he, it seems like he doesn't want to be criticized at all. Yeah, listen, logic. I, I think you know, especially on this show, we've we've been definitely hot and cold while we have given you credit for certain things. Um, like. Yeah, sometimes people haven't. Whether it was you know you know Joe used to be on you know a, a early version of um, Everyday Struggle, and he used to say he couldn't identify with the music. That happens. W- Wayno used to be on here saying that for some new newer rappers he couldn't identify with what they're saying. You know what right. I mean? Depending on their content, that happens. It's a valid criticism. You know, I, I think it really goes from a space of could you handle cr- criticism or is it too much? And I think that debate will continue. Anyway, let's keep it moving. Um, Fab. Yes. My guy Fab, he was actually on a, a episode of Ti's Expeditiously podcast, and they were discussing that yo supposedly labels used to have artists kind of pretty much hide your family life, so you hide your relationship. And this is what Fab said: you're supposed to be projected as a single man. Mm-hmm. Wait, no, you've been in this, you, you've been in this game a long time. You be telling me about you, yo, intern at Rockefeller. You know a little bit more about mm-hmm. this. Than me, is this facts? Absolutely, that's facts. And I feel like it's still facts to this day to an extent. Like labels used to try to get you lie about your relationship, or even not just that, your age. You know what I mean? Like to the point where people who are still trying to get in the game today will bring an artist around and be like, "Yo, he's twenty nine, but I'm gonna say he's twenty three. So what the fuck are you gonna do on his thirtieth birthday on Instagram? You know what I'm saying? It's like no you, birthday party, right? <laughs> celebrate in the club. <laughs> you can't hide shit. But yeah, I th- they they did because you know I think that people was trying to market. They were trying to market the whole bachelor type thing, you know. What I mean, it was, and and even with women too. I mean, when I look at like, I think I think a lot of people changed that, but like Queen Naja, you know, I think she she changed a lot of that shit. Women, they didn't want people to know that women were in like full on relationships and married because it made them seem, I guess, it, it made them seem less desirable from a marketing standpoint or some shit like that. Which I think is really frivolous because if you if you look at history, man, whether people are in relationships or not. If you got heat, you got heat. You know what I mean, like if you got heat, you got heat. But I think the whole idea of maybe I can't get a chance. Like remember what Safari said he was going through with Nikki. Mm-hmm. That was another one. You know what I mean? He was saying that he was in a long relationship with her, but it was marketed that he was just the the, the dude who hung around her, some shit like that. You know, uh, it's interesting that that used to happen then because it's. I think it happens maybe both ways now. Right. And I know for a fact it happens both ways now. By the way. Uh, what's that? What's that? Uh, young girl, Noah Cyrus, she's been in five fake relationships. Every I don't I think she's on Columbia. Every time there's a rapper getting cold, they put her with said rapper. Lil Xan <laughs> even came out to say, "Hey, this relationship you saw me and her in, the label put it up. The, the label That's set crazy. it up." Now, what I'm trying to say is that it's kind of a reverse effect because most of these guys now, mm-hmm. they're not even their appeal isn't being sex symbols anymore. You know, right. like like the the, the male rapper like. You're seeing the G unit. Um, you, you're seeing Gary and I try and cover fifty. Got his shirt off. Girls love him. Right. Like, for the most part, these dudes, Dude. most of them are trying to market. They're marketing emotion. They're not marketing being a sex symbol. Right. So to be honest, when you have them, when when your music is a lot about emotion, this and third, I've seen more rappers get girlfriends and show off their girlfriends now than ever before. So yeah. it, I, I guess it's it's a huge contrast um, to now. But I do think it still exists. Like, you know what I mean? If, if there is, say, an upcoming artist, I could imagine it was probably really tough for Cardi B to say to Atlantic, yeah, not only am I going to have a kid, yeah, me, Mary, yeah. Th- this is my guy. This, mm-hmm. yeah, 
I'm getting married, right? And of course, that came in a lot of drama. So maybe, you know, the label or whoever else that was the handlers, they're like, okay, we're getting the same amount of attention. But it's interesting to see, like, how that might affect, you know, um, people's actual personal lives. Imagine yeah. faking a relationship. This shit, exactly. And actually, it seems like a double edged sword, too, because I feel like, you know, for as many people that are like, oh, that's so cute, relationship goals and all that other bullshit, you got a whole community of people who don't want to see y'all do good and, and want to see y'all shit fall apart. So it's like, you damned if you do, damned if you don't. I feel like, for, for the most part, as an artist, like, you should try to keep as much as your personal life outside of your art. But the thing about now is that your personal life is what sells the art. For certain artists, though. You know what I mean? For certain artists. For certain artists, artists right. because I, I look at a lot of these, like, wh what is today's male rapper marketed as? A fucking <laughs> uh, uh, out of shape drug addict that use that walks around with guns all day like what what is today's artist market guys it's not the same men ain't the same men they used to be you know what i mean like, no 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 you're absolutely right about that and, right. and, and hey for, for better or for worse i think we're watching the evolution but i'm wondering are we getting to a place of of even greater happiness for artists because mm. if you had to lie about the fact that you had a whole baby mama or even wife that you were in love with because you got to portray to women especially r&b dudes right Good, you know right. nowadays you we could have just daniel caesar just on stage just kind of cooling out just singing you got to remember usher had to be having water dripping down his ass doing all type <laughs> of crazy stuff and to be honest when we did hear about you know of course we knew whatever with chili and everything like we we, we love hearing the breakup you know what right, i mean right, right. we, we, we want to hear them too much in love so We'll see how that goes on. Um, we did have a couple quick, uh, quick things to get into before we get out, uh, get out of here. Uh, just really quick thoughts, Wayno. Um, Trump says he's banning TikTok September fifteenth if they don't get a buyer within the U.S. market. He says they're data farming, they're sharing, you know, what I mean, U.S. consumer info. What's up, yo? Oh, I mean, I'm not a fan of Trump as a president, but as a businessman, he's just trying to make a business move for the country. That shit is crazy. I was like, I, but my thing is, is, like, I thought that I would see Trump be way more vocal about other issues than TikTok. Like, this TikTok shit has been such a big thing. But again, I just seen that Instagram is coming out with something called Reels, where they have TikTok's whole fucking interface of <laughs> the whole shit down pat, right? So hey. hey, 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 listen. I look at this and I and I say, yo, when it comes to Trump, mm -hmm. I'm like, when he's pretty much almost, he's about to force a maybe billion, maybe trillion dollar business move by a, a U.S. company buying it. How do we know that Trump is, has zero interest in whatever, because he's right. he's giving them a deadline. <laughs> you have to sell by this. Now, if the only person that wants to buy is this one, you don't have you don't even have time to be like, okay, let's find a buyer. So I'm wondering what his vested interests are beyond just being the president and, and supposedly looking out for the, uh, the U.S. population. Real quick, as we're continuing, mm -hmm. Tory Lanez, not deported. Not deported. It was, was previously reported that, um, you know, he had been deported, but we have now gotten more information that he's not um, deported. Um, I know personally, he's in Miami. <laughs> you right, get me? Right, right. Um, real quick thoughts about, you know, even that situation and even seeing people talk about his deportation. There was a petition going around. People wanted him to get deported. Right. Quick thoughts. Oh, uh, man, quick thoughts is just, uh, I mean, it's, it's still a very touchy situation, which I don't have any concrete facts on. But I just think that, you know, the best thing for Tory to do is just to stay low. You know what I mean? Stay low until his situation gets figured out. I mean, we are I, everybody knows how I feel about, you know, the situation regarding Meg. Um, with him, I don't even think it's about an issue of his side or whatever. That has to play out, you know, in, in the courts. Like, that has to play out in the courts, and we'll see where it goes from there. I can't really comment too much on it, but I think that he should really quarantine for real. You know what I mean? Like, it's, it's going to be a lot of judgment. It's going, somebody might throw something if he's in the wrong place, you know what I mean? And he's out there with his family, I'm hearing. So I think that he should just stay out of sight. Um, I'll just say due process. Um, yeah. I think Tory, uh, while, again, we've heard many versions of stories this and third, um, just like anyone living within, within the United States, we should allow him and afford him that opportunity. And while, of course, socially, we're going to hold you in court, socially. <laughs> we're going we're gonna to talk about some shit. Um I wouldn't sit here and wish, you know, um, criminally that he get, you know, uh, the book thrown at him for even something he's not even charged with right now. Right. You get me? Or, you know, like, wish, I, like, I hate when I see people like, yo, start this petition to get somebody out of here. I think, I get, I get it. We're, we're mad at everything that went on, but 
I think we have to just pump our brakes a little bit. Let's wait a little bit. Absolutely. Okay? We have to be spectators in this. <laughs> we definitely have to just true. be spectators. Right. True, true. Um, unfortunately, um, we're wrapping up with a few tragic um, um, stories, but I really wanted to touch on them real quick because they're timely. Uh, right. Frank Ocean's little brother, um, he passed away in a, in a car accident, you know, according to uh, Los Angeles CBS2. He was reportedly killed in a car crash on Sunday, and... Um, Frank's brother was a com he was accompanied by his classmate at that time, and both were declared dead. And uh, you know, condolences, man, condolences to Frank Ocean and his family. It's, it's really tough losing anybody, specifically a family member. I have little brothers, so that hit me a little bit. You know what I mean? Um, condolences. Uh, yeah, I always hate hearing stories like like this because you know sometimes we also look at the mode of transportation, which we all we all use driving sometimes as not that dangerous and. It's very dangerous. You know, I could imagine yeah. what Frank Ocean's going through. And I think, you know, he has so much fans around. I think we all got to send him some love right now. So Absolutely. our prayers and condolences go, go out to him and his family. Um, Chicago rapper. Again, it's a little bit negative tone and really a dark tone at the end of, of the show. But um, Chicago rapper FBG Duck. Mm -hmm. um, he was killed in a drive-by. And according to CBS, um, two out of Chicago, um, there were two others shot and injured he was 26 when he was rushed to the hospital. Uh, he was pronounced dead. He's been releasing music for 10 years and very well known and popular in the Chicago music scene. Yeah, Thoughts? man. Rest in peace, man. Rest in peace. You know, it's a, it's Chicago's a, a crazy place, man. I just hope that those brothers and sisters out there could get it together. Yeah, um, I was I was very shocked to see you know some people filming someone literally losing their life. Like, yeah. I, I feel like that there's sometimes a lack of, you know, humanity there. Like, everyone want to capture a moment on the phone. Like, certain things don't need to be documented and, you know, reproduced. However, all of this is shocking to me. This is this was downtown Chicago. Yeah, Downtown man, Chicago. The violence there has been crazy this year. I hope all the Chicago rappers, I hope they're all, I hope they do more to ensure their safety. Um, I get it. They're in a environment and trust me i can't really relate to it but i send the prayers and condolences of course you know his family and everybody who loves him as well like he's a very beloved figure um, out of chicago um last one which is the uh i know you saw the clip the explosion in lebanon Woo! yeah that was crazy, the explosion in lebanon man. i it, this is where i think empathy comes in i just seen the clip and i could just it it hurt my heart to think about the amount of people who were and you know proximity. affected by that, yeah. and um you know again according uh, according to the Guardian the explosion killed over a hundred people and left four thousand wounded. Um, we're getting mixed reports, but the, the most popular report I seen was that it was f uh, fireworks and gunpowder in like a factory that kind of like you know exploded, and again I'm just gonna think about how tragic it is. Rest in peace to anyone who lost their lives. I saw there was a video of a bride. There was, there was a bride who was actually, you know, taking some wedding pictures that day. And you see, like, almost the blast started happening. No, I, I believe she was still okay. But imagine, yeah. you know, you're, you're, we're operating our regular lives. And then some tragic shit like that just could interrupt it like that. What did you think when you saw the... the Man, I mean, when I, when, I, when I saw it, I mean, it, first and foremost, you know, seeing... Just the, I've never seen anything like that if it wasn't a movie, right? And then just seeing like how the after effect of the blast be, from people that were so far away, how it, 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 it moved, you know, it, it made me, like you said, empathy. You know what I mean, it made me think about the kids that's on the ground that might just be playing, you know what I mean? The people that's just going to work, you know, that's affected by this. Um, This this is this is really tragic, man. And, and like you said about the bribe, even though that's, this is going to, be affected by her, you know, she lived through this for the rest of her life, you know, this would be something that's synonymous with her wedding, you know, unfortunately, and man, my heart goes out to the people who are going through that tragedy, man, I can't imagine some shit like that happening where we at, you know, I think a lot of times we take for granted, you know, um, just w where we live and the things that transpire here or lack of, lack thereof. And you know, if if this something like this happened on our soil, or something like this happened where we live, you know, the the outcry publicly would be immense. So I'm just looking at it like, damn, you know, hopefully, you know, one day these people are able to bounce back from it. 
Yeah, absolutely. Uh, prayers goes goes out to all the people from Lebanon, but also definitely ones who are affected by that blast. You can imagine it's going to be a, lo- a long recovery process after that. Yeah. Um, listen, I hate leaving, but uh, we do have too. to wrap. We <laughs> got to get this show up. Right. Um, listen, Nadesco, we love you. By the way, you, if you're sister. on the East Coast and, and if you're anywhere, I know we talked about some tragic thing, things happening in the world, but please stay safe. There's a hurricane that's coming through the Northeast and coming with some heavy winds. A lot of people don't have power. The desk is, she's thugging it out right now. And I'm pretty sure she should be back tomorrow. Hopefully I held it down good for you guys. Wayno, thank you for, you know, being a Uh, good- Thank you, actually. For being a great co-host, you know, like you always are. And um, Mm -hmm. listen, uh, you'll see us back here tomorrow on Everyday Struggle, back on, was it Friday? Thursday, Friday? Thursday, 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 Friday, come on. I don't even know what day it is anymore, right? (laughs) <laughs> so I'll, we'll catch you guys tomorrow. Um, it's it's academics and of course Wayno. It's everyday struggle. Peace. Peace y'all.